Good afternoon, everyone, and welcome to our CPD webinar on climate change and flooding, what it means to your portfolio. Um, I would just like to check if you can all hear me. So if you can, can you please click the button that indicates you to raise your hand? That would be great. Great, thanks, guys. So my name is Lily. I'm the marketing specialist for GSMART and your host for today. Um, just want to say that if you've got any questions throughout the session, if you can pop them into the question box and I can ask them on your behalf throughout the session. I'll now hand over to my colleague, Paul Ellis, who will be presenting for you today. Thank you, Lily. So, hello to everyone. Good afternoon. So, um, today's topic is climate change and flooding and, and what it means to your uh, property portfolio. Um, so, we'll go through sort of a bit of introduction background, what the flood risk challenges might be for a, an asset manager. Then we'll look at the overview of, of UK flood risk uh, and the four main sources of flooding. So, what, what are the main contributors to risk? We'll look how that might change in the future uh, with climate change. And then we'll, we'll apply that to what's the impact for commercial property assets and portfolios, how are you going to manage that risk and, and consider it. And then what are the options if you are at risk? Uh, how will you manage that? And then how um, flood risk might be a key part of ESG reporting, uh, which is now sort of becoming more of a requirement. So just a quick background. So this is our, our leadership team. Uh, so we've got a big R&D department and then a team of consultants, environmental specialists in contaminated land, flood risk, drainage, uh, and that type of thing. So we, we work uh, for site acquisition, for portfolio review, and for, for development on site. So we really know we work at all stages, right from the initial screening through to detailed uh, design. Um, founded in 2014, and we're all about using uh, data and technology and combining that with the experience of our team to, to give advice to property professionals. So, for example, some of our the data that we've created, our groundwater flood risk map, is used in uh, majority of UK property transactions because some of our data is used by Landmark in, in one of their uh, transactions. Uh, so we're a member of various uh, property bodies, uh, Rick's technical partner, and we also do R&D funding, latest one by Space Agency. So getting back to what, what are the challenges that um, asset managers face? What, how does flood risk come into all the other things that an asset manager needs to consider? So uh, we look at the property level, so you may have a portfolio, a number of sites, and then for each individual site, understanding the spatial variation of risk on that site uh, and, and how severe it might be is important. So for that's the operational site management and taking precautions. But then also you need to have that portfolio, that top level view of all the, all the sites that you're managing and being able to see which are the most risky. Uh, and, and obviously the overall, if it's a fund that you work with or the overall value of that portfolio and how it might be impacted uh, by the flood risk. And that's both now and in the future. So some, some, some of you may be in for a long term investment. So you want to know over the lifetime that you own the site, you know, will it flood? What's the percentage chance that it would and what the impact that be? Uh, certainly now, uh, Acquisition is a much more fraught with you, you need, really need to find out before you acquire a new site whether it's going to have issues with the, the flood risk. Uh, it may be that the overall value of the site means that the flood risk doesn't matter or you can incorporate it in, in your decision. But certainly as a due diligence for acquisition and also when you're investing yourself at the site, uh, more and more flood risk is becoming a an item for discussion and reduction in pricing. Uh, uh, the, the valuation may also be connected with insurability. So can you get insurance each year? Often it's an annual renewal cycle for insurance. So you, you're not guaranteed to be able to insure the site for the next 20 years. Uh, and if a site's not insurable, uh, then that may affect the, the value of the property or it might you know, cost you more. Uh, so that's one of the factor. Market uh, market forces may change the valuation, even the perception of flooding, uh, even if the property hasn't actually flooded. Uh, if it's on a map that shows it's at risk, there may be an impact or there could be flooding in the area. So I think more and more 
blood risk will have a small part to play in the, all those factors that um, relate to valuation of the property, valuation of the fund and portfolio, etc. We touched on the operation resilience, so looking on a site specific basis, how likely is a business to be interrupted and therefore unable to pay rent? Uh, you know, how long before you could uh, repair a premises if it, if it did get subject to flooding? Um, or if you want to anticipate uh, a risk, maybe you can put in place mitigation measures, uh, flood defences, barriers, uh, except your business continuity plan. Uh, then these, uh, there's become increasing requirements for disclosure under the IFRS and ESG requirements. And so you want to, you know, what information you do need to disclose. So you need good data for that. Um, and you, then you want to demonstrate that you've considered it and you've managed that risk, uh, whatever comes up. But then obviously it's good if you can have access to some experts who can interpret the data for you and advise you on the next steps uh, once you advise a, a risk. And then on top of this, climate change is, is changing everything. Uh, depending on which climate change scenario you, you're following and sort of which time frame, which epoch. So there's quite a combination of things uh, around flood risk that I think it's important that you you consider uh, within your own portfolio. So why is why is flooding important? So some very quick stats just to highlight that a report by Aviva says one in three commercial properties UK at risk. Uh, more than half SMEs believe climate change is going to impact them. Um, however, three quarters of businesses don't have a business continuity plan that includes climate change and flood risk. So it's certainly something to think about. Uh, if you're a small business, 40% often close uh, if they do get flooded because it's very hard uh, to recover from that. 50 lost working days, average £80,000 of a, a cost. So it is a significant issue. Um, retail is the most at-risk sector. 32% uh, of commercial properties at risk um, are from that retail sector. 58% uh, don't have comprehensive flood insurance cover. So these are sort of background data from the insurance industry. Uh, now we favorite case study of mine, but just, just to bring it home, what, what the impacts might be. Uh, this is the soggy biscuit uh, case study. So uh, production of ginger nut biscuits or custard creams or bourbons, just to try and make it relevant. But um, so uh, back in uh, 2016, there was a major flood in Carlisle and one of the uh, properties affected was the uh, uh, the McVitie's uh, Biscuit Factory, where they produce those favourites. So it was one of the costliest uh, flood insurance claims, about 50 million in insurance costs. Um, 500 tonnes of soggy biscuits, reputational damage. Uh, it took six months before they could get back the supply of custard creams and, and bourbons. Uh, they did spend a rather large uh, amount on mitigation measures and site investigation to, to plan those properly. So it was quite a significant impact and it was the second time that the, the factory had been flooded. In this particular case, um, they'd done something, but um, there was other factors involved. There was a groundwater and some of the flood defences were bypassed. So they went back and um, I think they fixed the issue now, but it, it did cost them. So. It, it just goes to show that the impact that it can have on, on a, a site uh, and why it's worth thinking about in advance. Uh, so this is the site here. And good data is really the key. Having a good flood data allows you to look at all these things in advance uh, and understand what the risk is and then make decisions on how to manage it. So uh, in the center of the shot there, you can see that that's the factory. Uh, and then overlaid on it, these are all the, the different uh, sources of flooding. So if you were in the process of acquiring a site like that, uh, you might think twice or you may certainly consider how you were going to mitigate the impact uh, of that flood risk on the site. Obviously, this site's been here over 100 years, so uh, they inherited the, the location. But you can see a combination. There's no tidal flooding, but there is fluvial uh, flood risk. 
uh, surface water flood risk and groundwater. So the site um, uh, is uh, at risk from all of three of those sources. So it's important to understand the source of the flooding so you can design a mitigation measure and you can understand that combined risk of flooding. So it's, it increases the risk if they, these are often additive uh, risks. So I'll quickly sort of zoom out to uh, the UK as a whole. I think the point of these slides, so these are from the Met Office, this is rainfall data um, and it's presented as a percentage of the long-term average uh, so either 1980 to 2010 or 1990 to 2020 um, as time goes by so I mean I was putting these uh, slides together and realized how things have moved on since I first was doing these CPD but uh, so originally in 2014 on the on the far right, that's the rainfall in January 2014, and you can see it's more than 200% the long term average. Uh, and the thing about 2014, you may recall there was very widespread uh, regional flooding across the south of the UK. Uh, look, railways were closed and washed away, and it was quite a significant uh, amount of damage caused, primarily because it was a uh, several months of prolonged uh, rainfall one after the other went through and then the following year you can see the track of that rainfall uh, was across the north of the country and that's when we had the all the Cumbrian floods etc and herds of sheep being washed away but you can see it really depends on the intensity of the rain but also that spatial a track of where the, the rainfall occurs and uh, no two years are the same and then we've got on the left hand side that's 24 so you can see more than 170 percent of long-term rainfall and that was really across that sort of midlands uh, section north of london so rainfall is really the the thing that drives a lot of the flooding um, unless you're looking at coastal and tidal um, and it's just to show that it can occur anywhere it can be on the top of a hill uh, it's not all about being in a river valley or or on the coast so really that indicates any of your sites could be at risk and just because they've never flooded before doesn't mean that they won't flood it's it's really just a percentage a percentage game and within these big sort of national views you get those short intense thunderstorms uh, which are really site specific but can generate a, a lot of water in a short time so just giving an idea of the variability um, so uh, we shouldn't get complacent and then looking into the, the complex, complex reality of flooding, there's, there's many sources of, of floods. So I guess at a top level as an asset manager, maybe flooding is considered just as a whole, does my property flood, is it at risk? But in order to solve those problems and really quantify what the risk is, um, some detail on the source of the flooding is, is necessary because it, the type of flooding will affect the cost of the damages, you know, how long will the flood water be there, how contaminated that flood water would be, uh, what type of mitigation measures may be required. So if it's a coastal def defences, then you need to build the barriers um, uh, along the coast. But if it's a groundwater flood that comes up through the floor, then you may need to tank your basement, uh, put in drainage systems, etc. So there's a variety of floods. The four main types are, are river. So you can see in the top left corner, uh, I think that's uh, Datchet from uh, 2014. So it's associated with a lot of water higher in the catchment that moves down the river, overtops the banks uh, onto the floodplain. But it is often associated with other uh, types of flooding um, as well as the river. Um, and then if you move to the right, you can see some rather wild conditions on the coast. So coastal or tidal flooding is where you get a high tide, so a naturally high spring tide. You will get a, a low pressure system, which causes the, the tide to rise even higher. And then that's often associated with winds. So you'll get large waves on top of that. So you'll get a higher, higher sort of tidal average level uh, and then the waves on top of it. So that combination can be quite significant. Uh, and then the bottom left, you can see that's a picture of uh, one of the ladies who used to work for us at her basement. This was the second time it was flooding, so the, this is groundwater flooding uh, 
it coming out of the ground. Uh, the, uh, the basement wasn't quite waterproof, so the water found its way in and then it was there for several weeks and had to refurbish the entire basement, etc. Uh, so that's groundwater flooding and then surface water flooding. You can see the cars, etc., driving through there. So that's intense uh, sort of local flooding from within the catchment, very heavy rainfall accumulates and the draining systems can't cope with it and remove it. And then you can see rather embarrassingly, that was the new um, uh, tube station. I think that's Pudding Lane or one of those. So obviously there, there would have been a flood risk assessment, but it didn't cover all eventualities and, and the station flooded there. So these are all different types of flooding and to understand what might drive them and what the future change under climate, uh, different climate scenarios is important. Obviously, sea level rise with the melting of the ice caps, that sort of imminent, in more intense rainfall, more runoff. Uh, so all these things need to be understood. And then there's a nice breakdown. This is based on residential, but this is from some of our data. So you can see nearly half of it, uh, sort of that risk, comes under the heading of surface water uh, across the UK. In terms of the damages, but then we've got a, a sizable chunk of the rest of it split between the groundwater, the coastal, um, and the river. So, what are the sources of information when you need to understand flood risk uh, across the UK? So, obviously, we have the historic floods, um, so that gives you some information, but it's not comprehensive because each flood is subject is a different return period, there's a different amount of rainfall that, that drove it. Um, and since the, since the flood occurred, there may be flood defences put in place, etc. And not everywhere has flooded uh, yet. So historic data is very good, it's a starting point, um, but it's not, it doesn't allow you to take a full national view or have a consistent comparison between sites. So for that we need model data, uh, which is available at sort of different scales so the catchment uh, try to look at the catchment simulation at that big big scale and then you zoom in and you can see this is uh, river flow modeling and different levels along that river at those nodes and then we can zoom in right to the property specific level sort of that five meter or less uh, resolution so a lot of the data to do these assessments comes from this this sort of modeling simulation, which is obviously cal calibrated against historic and known events, uh, but it is, a, it is a simulation. And so within each of those models, there would be models of specific flood mechanisms. So the river, you would model what the channel profile was and how much water was coming down the river. In this case, one of our specialities that we do at Geosmart is, a, is groundwater risk. So we have several mechanisms uh, to look at that and this is quite important because of the long duration of groundwater flooding uh, and also in commercial buildings many of them have basements uh, sort of buried infrastructure which makes them even more uh, vulnerable so for, for groundwater we look at the main mechanisms which would be the bedrock aquifer such as the chalk after prolonged rainfall the uh, groundwater levels rise or in um, reaction to um, flooding of a river, you often get a response in the adjacent floodplain, in gravels, etc. Water levels rise and that can actually circumvent uh, any flood defences that are in place. So we have a typically modelled groundwater, um, several return periods which gives a depth um, uh, for each uh, return period uh, resulting from groundwater seeping out of the ground and then ponding in those locations. Um, so then I just want to explain something. This is a surface water, so this is where you get an intense rainfall, you drop it on a surface and it runs off and you, you model the flow path and where it accumulates. And we often uh, look at model data in terms of return periods. Uh, so these are really percentages rather than, you see it says one in 30, one in 100, one in 1,000. It doesn't mean that uh, it's not going to happen for 100 years. Uh, what it means is there's a one divided by 100 or sort of a 1% a, a, a chance every year that that flooding would occur. And so you can see the more frequent 
they would tend to be lower severity, so less rainfall, but it happens more often. Therefore, the extent of the flooding would be more restricted and the depths smaller. And then as we go up the return periods, so they get more extreme, but less likely. So for the one in a thousand, which is the 0.1%, you see the area of flooding is more extensive uh, and the depths are much uh, deeper. So that's, this is how we would consider flooding and then how we then translate that into a, a cost of flooding on the site or an overall risk uh, score associated with that uh, damage. Um, and we, to do that, we would use um, a, a cost curve. So you can see here, the typical one for residential storm damages. So along the bottom x-axis, there would be depth uh, and then there would be costs, sort of pounds per square meter on the uh, y-axis and you can see once once the flooding has uh, breached the threshold level you get a sudden step up in the costs and then a more sort of gradual uh, rise uh, with with the flood depth so we come on to to climate change so um, we all know that there's various predictions the weather's uh, the planet's getting warmer that means there's more uh, capacity for evaporation of, uh, of water and more energy in the system. So more storms, more water that they can then obviously fall as uh, rain and, and cause flooding in various forms. So this is some uh, data from the Environment Agency, sort of broken down by these regions. Uh, but there's obviously, you can get that in much more finer detail as you can see with those catchments uh, you can really zoom in and each one of those will have a prediction of what uh, changes uh, it, uh, may result from climate change so in this one we can see uh, we have an upper a higher and a central um, scenario so these are these climate uh, modeling scenarios done at the big scale and then these are then uh, sort of reduced down to what the impact will be on the, on the local scale within those rivers so in this instance, we're talking about peak river flow. So if I pick the upper scenario in the southeast, uh, predictions are that we could get flows increasing uh, by up to 100%. So that's a very significant, and that obviously under the most extreme climate scenario, but every month that goes by, we sort of talk about uh, whether they're getting more extreme. Um, but even under some of the central scenarios, <laughs> we're, we're talking 25 to 30% uh, uh, increase in risk. So uh, it's something to uh, to think about and it just gives you that context of what might be happening across the UK. Obviously in some parts of the country, risk will be increasing more significantly than in others. So there's some spatial uh, variation and obviously the spatial variation in the portfolio properties that you may hold. So in some parts of the UK or properties nearer the coast, maybe more at risk uh, from sea level rise or runoff in urban environments. So just understanding the context of that climate change. Um, so when we look at this in, in our own data, we, we look at the different RCP, so that's the, uh, the concentration pathway. So if we look first at the graph on the right, um, for different amounts of CO2 that get into the atmosphere will cause different amounts of warming. So uh, 8.5 is taken as the sort of the more extreme case. So we've got on the y-axis we have temperature and on the x-axis we have the, uh, the time period, so over the next 100 years or so. Um, so you can see most of the scenarios, we've got the sort of the more milder 2.6 and, and 4.5 and 6. So they both, they all start off uh, similar obviously we're already past 2020 and then the big divergence sort of starts to occur 2050s um, onwards uh, so the more extreme the temperature change then that will have an impact on sea level rise more ice melting uh, more stormy conditions uh, increased uh, intensity of rainfall events so depending which ones of these concentration pathways we follow which will result in a certain amount of warming and energy in the system, uh, then that's then modeled through to what's the impact on rainfall, uh, surface water runoff, river flow, groundwater levels, uh, 
sea level rise. So it's, it all sort of plays through uh, the system. So just to give you an idea, here we've got some winter under RCP 8.5. You see over time, precipitation rises up to about 25%. And then the colored um, shading indicates the envelopes. So and none of these models indicate an exact outcome. It's all about they run an ensemble of different models with slightly different conditions, and you get a spread of what climate change might result in. So there's no one uh, guaranteed uh, scenario, and it's all going to behave like this. It's it's more of an envelope of what the changes might uh, lead to. So you can see here in sea level change, even under the, uh, the basic RCP 4.5, um, we could be looking at level rises of you know, half a meter uh, in the next hundred years, and then if we follow the 8.5, it could be significantly more than that. And then we can see uh, in the bottom right that's how uh, sea level rise might vary around the coast uh, because of glacial rebound and, and different things. And then how do we think about that on a site-specific case? So we would combine. We know all the the four sources of flooding. Uh, we can predict. The shift in depth and frequency that may occur as a result of climate change making flooding more likely. We would then calculate that through well, what are the impacts on the on the, the depth of flooding at site and the cost of that flooding. And then we combine all of those different sources of flooding and the costs from those in, into one index. So it allows you to go from the very detail on these multiple return periods uh, and, and different depths of flooding. And we combine it into one single uh, score, a flood risk score that represents the present day. So you can see in this case, of so this example, the site would have a score today of 34, uh, which is sort of a low, uh, low uh, risk. Uh, but then over time, um, if you take the high um, impact scenario, 8.5 it may go up into the sort of the score 50 which will then shift it into the medium risk category so you can see these are how um, risk may change over time uh, so along the bottom axis you've got the time and on the side axis this risk score from 0 to 100 zero being a very low risk or negligible and 100 being high risk uh, you may uh, need to talk to your insurer in order to get insurance etc so that was a very quick uh, run through the, the high level, what is flooding and the data behind it. Are there any uh, questions before I go on? Uh, yes, Paul, we do have one question. Do all types of flooding carry the same risk? No, well, that's, that's a good question. So no, um, which is precisely the reason we, we look at them separately. So some types of flooding may, if they do occur, may have higher depths or higher flow velocities. So if you get flooded from the river or the sea, then that would perhaps be uh, more uh, danger to uh, life and limb, etc. Whereas other sources of flooding like groundwater might be more of a chronic uh, source of flooding. So the duration may be several weeks to months, in which case the cost of the flooding is actually can be two to three times higher just because of the duration and the uh, the damage to the fabric of the building and obviously business interruption uh, costs uh, as well. So there are definite differences between the, the types of flood. Okay, great. Um, so I'll carry on. Um, so now, what has all that got to do with my commercial property assets? Uh, what's the impact going to be? So in order to understand that, we, we would sort of build up a model. So we would get a, a client's portfolio of the different sites and, and their locations, and also the spatial extent, the area they occupy. So some sites can be pretty large. Uh, we would then combine that with these four main sources of flooding. So we have the depth and extent from each of those flood sources. Uh, you know the probability of that. Uh, we sort of combine those two together, um, and then we look at the, the impact of climate change under the different climate scenarios and how um, that may affect the damages. So for every depth of flooding, I showed you the curve, we can calculate the cost. We can combine that cost across the whole site. And then we can look at the probability of each flood event and, and uh, do, a, do a calculation and combine that to work out what an average damage 
on a year, if you own that site for the next thousand years, what would be the average damage you pay a year? And that's similar to the calculations an insurer would do to work out your insurance premium, et cetera. So then we can put all that in the database, we can link it to a GIS, um, and then that allows us to output a whole range of different parameters and indices for for your for the portfolio. So what's the what's the risk at each site? combined overall risk and then we can then compare between sites and sort of rank the entire portfolio from low to high uh, risk and there's various tools and things dashboards uh, that we can look at to do that so um, typically we would start with the, sort of the shape files for every site and their location across the UK I'll show you now, um, I'll switch to uh, an example portfolio, 50 assets. Um, then we can look at the, the damage uh, per year that may result on each side. We could also look at the total value, the capital value of that specific asset, because obviously your higher value assets, you'd be more concerned about those than the lower value. So it's a balance between what the risk is and the impact on the asset. We would then generate a, a site-specific report for every site, so really granular detail at five, five meters of resolution. But that also allows us to do the calculation in our database, so we can, <coughs> we can pull out the total cost of flooding and the, um, uh, the index value of that flooding, um, and thereby uh, allow it to go into the dashboard and rank it and get that sort of top-level fund view or portfolio view. And then once you've screened your, all your entire portfolio, you could then decide, well, some of these high risk assets, can I mitigate them? Can I uh, divest myself of them? You know, I can make a plan or something to do about it. So if we just, if I just break here, I'll just show you uh, our, a, a typical uh, site. So we'll come back to this. This is a, um, our high risk site from the example portfolio. So we, typically we would get the shape file. So this is a, um, I think this is a supermarket, this one, we pick some random range of retail, industrial and sort of commercial office spaces. So you can mix them all in. Um, and then, so once we have the site outline, we can get the current risk, <laughs> risk score, which is the, the combined risk from uh, all the different sources of flooding. So we can see, for this particular site, we've got fluvial, it's got a score of 95 and groundwater score of 30. So these are the two, two key flood risks that we would need to think about for this site. Um, and these contribute, it's not a directly additive, but they contribute to this overall combined score. Um, and then we also see that that would go up by four points. So into the future, that it scores increasing to 100 uh, due to climate change by, by the 2050s under the RCP 8.5. So for every site, you would have all the details. So maybe the site owner or the facilities manager might want to drill into this detail. You can see the flood extent. So here we've got uh, the sites affected by uh, uh, fluvial flooding. You've got a bit of uh, surface water fluvial flooding around the edges, not too bad. And then groundwater. So in this location, we're obviously getting a groundwater response when the river level goes up, groundwater. In the, in the river gravels has kind of come up. If there's basements and drainage systems on the site, it may be impacted by that. So you can you get distances to flood zones, so it may impact transport to the site and deliveries or car parking, etc. So all these are factors if you're on that site scale looking at the facility or if you're the, the portfolio manager, it may be affecting the yield that you can get from it or the or the value of that property. So I won't go into it too much, but you can get costs of flooding for the average annual damage uh, or the event costs. So in this case, we can see that uh, for the, the fluvial case, it's here it's gonna cost over a million pounds if the entire site's flooded. And this is in, in saying damages to the property that would need to be fixed. Uh, goes up considerably if in the more extreme events. So that is, um, something to think about, and this is with, with defences, so then you may need to consider, can I put some flood barriers in, can I, can I mitigate? 
and then obviously all the usual data. So I'm sure you've probably had one of these reports from Landmark or Groundshore, one of the other providers. But they tend to just give you a lot of maps and says high, medium, low, for all the different sources of flooding, and sort of leave you to uh, to get on with it. So the the idea of this system is we take it forward and uh, into uh, numerical uh, values, so you can then with a single number from 0 to 100, you can then compare sites, and then you can you can see you know how they would change uh, with the climate factor impact. So it makes it a very powerful tool. Uh, obviously, you need all the maps and the spatial extent. Uh, you can look at you know what the the flood depths are for those different return periods and compare them with the threshold level on the site, uh, for example. And this is for each source of uh, flood risk. And then uh, you see another example. So then you can drill down into what the climate change impact would be for for these different scenarios. So you can see at this particular site. It's already at higher risk, so it's only going to go up by by a couple of points anyway. But you can imagine a a lower risk site; it may it may show you changing uh, the boundary. So you've got the site specific information, but then that also translates itself into into that portfolio view. So all the information from each individual site uh, can then be combined in, in into a dashboard view. Um, so you may this is the front page so in this case we've got 50 sites and we want to look at let's say the whole portfolio or you may want to break that down to sort of individual funds within that top level portfolio so in this case uh, there's one with a 28 example one 28 properties and 22 and that might be the individual fund managers might be uh, more interested in that so uh, if we look into a bit more detail, so on this on these 50 sites that we've picked at random, so the um, you can ch choose which uh, which portfolio you're looking at. So in this case, uh, we can see if we look at column F, so 20% of the properties are a negligible risk, uh, which in this case has 10 10 properties. We've in order to uh, sort of make it representative we have picked these randomly but we've got uh, say 10 at negligible risk and, and 28 at very low risk and, and two at low so that in itself is a useful thing as an asset manager you can say right well these sites probably don't really need to do much more work on them now because they they're at low or very low or negligible risk so then immediately that allows you then to focus on the higher risk sites so we've got three at medium three at high and four at very high. And those ones you would probably want to follow up and do a bit more assessment, you know, talk to the facilities manager, has it flooded before, any, any known problems, uh, and then follow up with a uh, site visit, et cetera. So you've got that high level view of what's in each uh, risk category. And then you can also, let's see, well, actually, you know, two of the higher risks were, um, the very high were from fluvial sources, um, and then a couple of them were from uh, fluvial, and then tidal tends to be lower risk and, and groundwater. So you can see the breakdown by the, the flood source, uh, various charts that would tell you the proportions uh, related to groundwater and fluvial, etc. Uh, this is important because it, to some extent it dictates the cost of mitigation measures and what what type of thing you might do, or if a site's at risk from groundwater and it's got a basement, then actually that might be more important to you uh, to focus on. And then we get the total cost, so what on average cost per year, average annual damage, uh, which is a sort of a, a proxy for what your insurance premium, what they might consider charging you to, to insure that site. Uh, then we can see the benefit of flood defences. So this is for fluvial and, and tidal. So you can see a uh, significant increase uh, in, in uh, flood costs without the benefit of the flood defences uh, for fluvial and even more so for tidal. So it goes up from 400,000 uh, to uh, you know 1.5 um, uh, billion for tidal. So you can see 
how much your site would be benefiting from those defences and look into whether the government's going to keep keep on building them and improving them to, to compensate for, for climate change. Then you can uh, rank uh, the uh, in order of risk your properties. So we the, what the site I showed you for the example report. So this one, that's the top, the top risk. So you can jump between, uh, so this one here that I showed you, this is the top risk, so it's calculated the total sum of all the risk within that site boundary is 96, um, and then it sort of produces all the other data that goes with it. And then you can see, you can go from that site detail to the, the top level portfolio review, and it pulls all the data through. So each of these sites uh, um, you've got <coughs> for and, and the data that goes with it, and then you have the full, full data set here. Um, so if you needed to export this, for example, into your own internal systems or for your um, ESG reporting, et cetera, you've got, got all the data in a database for each site there. Um, and then, as I say, we can look at the, the climate change so we can see the sites that come from uh, medium risk to high risk. So in this case, uh, we've got seven now in medium, five in high and six in very high. This is under the most uh, extreme uh, scenario. And this is right out, so this is in the 2080s, uh, which is probably beyond the, the time scale of, that you're looking at, unless it's really long-term investment. But certainly 2050s, you can see there's not been a lot of change. Only one property has gone up from uh, high to very high uh, by the 2050s. So you may want to look at that one as well uh, and think about it. What you might want to want to do with that site. Um, so there's various sort of top level information. You can again, there's a breakdown of how the costs might change in the future. Uh, in, by the 2050s, the damage costs may may go up. Uh, and it tells you a change in those costs, uh, etc. Um, and then there's different ways to uh, sort the risk. So it could be by the average annual damage. And sort it by what the risk is in, in the 2050s, for example. Right, so I better um, jump back to the uh, final slides in the PowerPoint presentation. I think we've gone gone through these. So, but it does allow you to rank rank your portfolio in order of risk, and, and perhaps discard the low low risk ones and focus on those at medium to high risk. So you can focus your your assets and your risk management. So what can you do? So you can you can consider how how that flood risk might impact the valuation of the property, uh, and whether you you know you'd want to want to divest or, or it or, or whether you can get insurance into the future and what climate change might do to that. And you can look at how you might mitigate that that flood risk or adapt to it. Um, you may want to think about the what the building uses and the business interruption for, for the client or the tenant, and whether they can afford to, to keep operating if they did get flooded. Um, and maybe some sort of liaison with the client about business continuity, et cetera, uh, may be a prudent uh, approach. So pass on some of this information. Um, and then obviously there's some financing. There may be a requirement uh, Certainly, a requirement to have insurance each year uh, with a loan or some sort of agreement, and whether the value of the property changes and there's a certain amount of uh, collateral, obviously, uh, associated with that loan loan to value uh, ratio. And obviously, as many many assets have financing, then that is an important thing to consider. So, what what can you do if you you've screened your portfolio, you've gone from the the site specific to the, the top level uh, portfolio risk, you picked out top 10 risky sites. So then the next step would obviously be to drill down, do a more detailed assessment of those, understand that the source of the flooding, uh, look at those flood defences, if they benefit from flood defences, how do we know about all the key ones? Because the top level screening is based on national modelling, etc. And there's no uh, there's nothing better than a site-specific assessment. 
you know, do you do we need to do a survey which would compare flood levels with threshold levels, and then you may find actually the water wouldn't enter your building, and so the risk is is less. Or you may want to look at some uh, options for flood barriers and defences, and, and get some quotes from uh, suppliers to install that. Certainly, I would want to think about a business continuity plan and also business planning, sort of financial planning at the, the fund portfolio level. Um, and then for the local, you know, how are you going to evacuate the site if, if it is at risk? So you could get a detailed uh, flood risk assessment, which would probably be the next phase of that. Um, maybe a site visit, look at different uh, mitigation measures, do some further work, surveys and modelling if, if necessary, depending on the, on the costs. So then the possible outcomes, you do your initial risk screening, then you want to verify that risk. So you you find the top sites at risk, you would drill down into those, verify that risk. So then you would either de-risk the site on the basis of some local information on threshold or flood depth or special drainage system or mitigation measures that have already been installed. You would think about it in the in the business continuity plan to manage the risk, identify options uh, if if you wanted to take it further, or you may think this site is 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 so problematic and it's not essential for my portfolio. I might want to sort of divest myself of it before it becomes uh, more well known as a as impacted by flood risk in the future. So there is commercial advantage uh, potentially uh, to be gained. So are there any questions um, on that? I see we've got nine minutes left. Um, yes, Paul, uh, just one question. How quickly would a portfolio review take? So it's, it would be a, a relatively rapid process. Often the hardest thing is to, uh, to get the site boundaries for the different assets. Uh, we can, that can be done or you can get it from the um, land registry. But so those would be digitized in. Uh, then the, re the reports, you get the uh, screening reports run and the information extracted into the database. And then what we would typically do would be once the whole portfolio is assessed, we would then drill down and sort of do a portfolio wide assessment, uh, focusing on those top, top riskiest assets. Um, and that could be done uh, sort of within a month month or two of instruction typically the the longest part is the is the back and forth with the um, the asset manager to uh, agree the site boundary but that's a typical time within uh, sort of 20 days subject to all the information being available right i'll, I'll crack on so um, often there's a a growing demand in, in, in companies for esg reporting for for regulatory requirements um, and so absolutely all the information that you can get from a portfolio assessment may be applied uh, to that ESG reporting. So we've had the Bank of England talking about enhancing banks and insurers approaches to managing financial risks. So that may not be directly applicable to you as a portfolio manager, but certainly you will be interacting with the banks and insurers. So their, their approach uh, probably uh, carries over into how you would think about your risk and how they would want the information uh, reported to them. Um, so firms should seek to understand potential and current future impacts of the physical and transition risk factors of which flooding uh, is obviously key to clients, counterparties and organisation in which the firm invests or may invest. So um, there's some there's a good steer there about that. Uh, and then the risk ranking process was specifically identified uh, by the Financial Stability Board as the process um, that should be gone through then before you go in and collect more data. So you want to rank, rank the risk uh, to your assets. Uh, so many companies using international financial uh, reporting standards, IFRS, and then there's some TCFD uh, reporting requirements, and these sort of can be combined. Some of them may be replaced by new guidance as it, as it comes in. But typically the IFRS guidelines uh, say the entities as a minimum has got to disclose the total leasable floor area um, within the one in a hundred year flood zones from those different sources. So that and there's several other bits of data, but it's all 
uh, can be signposted uh, and extracted uh, from from that portfolio room. But you want you want that information to, to come out of it when you when you do that process. Um, so and then there's various um, guidance uh, on different climate say change scenarios that you may want to consider. So 8.5 being the most extreme. Or the, you may have your own internal in-house reporting system, in which case you might want to import some data from the sort of your flood risk uh, specific um, assessment and, and bring that across into your own uh, internal system or one of these bigger bigger platforms. It's, it's fairly easy uh, easy to do that. But I think the flood the insight you get on that flood risk is important in its own right and that level of detail and understanding how it might impact your your assets or not impact them um or hopefully help you sleep easier at night um so, so winding up now we asset managers i would recommend that you identify uh, flood risks within the current portfolio you've got and then certainly during um, the acquisition process more and more clients will be requesting that uh, data up front so also when you when you divest the property uh, chances are whoever's acquiring will be doing their own homework on the flood risk, etc. But the faster you can incorporate this information and gain a commercial advantage from it, uh, I guess the better. So it's good to quantify the impacts, go beyond just the high, medium, low to, to really understand in uh, a bit more granularity about what those impacts actually mean and how your, your investment might be affected now and also with climate change um, and then you can prioritize actions to manage the risk uh, and then plan uh, what, what would you do if one of the properties did flood look at resilience and mitigation measures and use as part of the the business planning process and for um, for esg uh, reporting so um i guess that's sort of in a quick run through with the team would be very uh, Happy to, to talk further, and so would I. If there's any other questions, I can follow up afterwards, or if you'd like a more um, uh, detailed demonstration, this is the team who would uh, happily uh, get back to you. Um, so that's it for me. Any more questions, or over to uh, Lily? Thanks, Paul. There aren't any more questions for now. Um, if anybody did have any questions, please do contact us, as Paul said. Our email address is inquiries at gsmartinfo.co.uk and our phone number's on there as well, as well as our website. Um, we hope you found the session useful. Please do reach out directly to our team and we would be happy to offer a free demo of our portfolio review service. If you think the session would be useful for any of your colleagues or contacts, we will have the session available uh, recorded on demand under our CPD section in the next few days. Thank you all very much for listening. Yeah,